Omaha's news leader, chronicling the stories and people making a difference in our community. This is KETV News Watch 7's Chronicle. Good morning and thanks for joining us for KETV News Watch 7's Chronicle. I'm Sarah Feely. All March long, we've celebrated the inspirational women who've paved the way for progress throughout history and the trailblazers who continue to break those barriers today. This morning, we're bringing you our Women's History Month reports on innovators here in the metro. Plus, we'll hear from the Women's Fund of Omaha on the challenges that women still face today. First, women have a long history of working in manufacturing dating back to the iconic Rosie the Riveter campaign during World War II. But women are still underrepresented in those jobs. KETV News Watch 7's Joey Savchik brought us this report from the Logier plant in Omaha where women help to build a more inclusive future. When she calls into the loudspeaker, it's pretty easy to believe Vicki Salinas is a boss. Huh? You're gonna be full. I never thought I would be in charge of men that are way taller than me. But she has no trouble going head to head with the men around her. Salinas is the only female lead in her department at Legier. It's definitely been something I never thought I would achieve. But she's been stacking up those achievements here for seven years. I've noticed that friends, even family, they think this is a male job. It's actually not. Women definitely have a place here. In fact, about 27% of Lazier's workforce are women. That includes jobs in offices and in production. Nationwide, about 33% of manufacturing workers are women. Uh, believe it or not, women can weld, and I have seen them do it. You have to be an advocate for yourself. Nebraska's chapter of women in manufacturing says there's always a push to get more women to the plant. Limiting your manufacturing workforce to just men really limits the number of applicants you could bring in. But seeing women on the floor is not exactly new. My grandmother had worked here years ago. Building runs in Paula Blunt's blood. Her grandma was a real life Rosie the Riveter. She was a big aspect of my life and it, uh, it encouraged me to be just like her. And while Blunt feels her grandma's spirit while building shelves, she can see through anyone who says sexism is a thing of the past. They would just be like, um, oh, you're you're a woman. You can't do this. Oh, you know, um, let's show you how a man can do it. This is a man's job. This is a man's world. That only sparked her desire to prove them wrong. At the plant, she has a hard and fast rule. Work harder and faster. They don't intimidate me um, whatsoever. What they can do, I can do too. A message that resonates as women work their way to the top of the trades. Women in manufacturing is also welding a support system, especially when companies don't have a diversity and inclusion program. Well, joining me now from the Women's Fund of Omaha is Joe Giles, and the executive director. Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us. And, Thank you. You know, first, tell us a little bit about the organization that you work with and some of the work that you do. Absolutely. So the Women's Fund of Omaha has been around since 1990, and it was a group of women in Omaha who were thinking about women and their ability to rise in terms of job opportunities in our community, on boards, and looking at what's happening in terms of women in C-suites, so senior leadership. And so those were some of the beginnings of the Women's Fund and some of the issues that we started with back in 1990 were things like childcare, things like domestic violence abuse, um, and here we are 30 years later and we're still addressing those issues and more. Um, so what we do at the Women's Fund is we research those issues that are impacting women and girls, and then we fund innovative solutions, so looking at community partners that are doing the work, um, that value align with us, and that are trying to remove oppression for women and girls. And then we also have an advocacy and education arm. So we believe that system change can happen. Oftentimes we have to raise our voice and get involved in the uh, civic engagement process. So that's a, that's a big task. Yes. in and of itself but to have so many arms that's a lot going on it's a lot uh, we have an incredible staff and a lot of work well what are some of the biggest inequalities that you still see 
Well, I mean, I think we've all felt this with the pandemic the last two years plus that we've been living through and the differences in how it's impacted women and how it's impacted men. I mean, one of the things that we see is that women aged 25 to 54 have not recovered back in the workplace at the same rate as men. And typically that's because women in that age group are most likely working and also have caregiving responsibilities, whether that's young children or school age children or elderly people in their home that they're caregiving with. You know, we in talks about that, we've talked in our newsroom quite a bit about how one person will stay home because their paycheck went a lot to cover that child care cost. Is there still that sort of difference in pay that some person is making less and it's often going to segment something like child care? Absolutely. I mean, when, you, we, when we look at equal pay, women are still making 82 cents to the dollar that men make, and those are white women. So if we think about for women of color, it's dramatically different. So for black women, it's about 64 cents on the dollar, and Latinas and Asian Americans, it's about 53 cents on the dollar to a man. So when you think about how that impacts a household, whether that's a single mom, whether it's a two-parent household or a two-person household, that economic disparity exists for that home immediately, but also when you think long-term in terms of saving for retirement or um, college education for young people, it really impacts the household if women are making less than men. And that research, is that nationwide or is that local here to Omaha? Both, yes. So equal pay passed uh, about 60-ish years ago, no, 100 years ago in 1963. So by the time we get to 2059 is when it will be equal for women and men. So we're still not there nationally. So which is, we're working on closing working that on gap, it. Yes. but is it, how does it differ here in the metro? Are we seeing that gap close more quickly or is it about the same as nationwide? It's about the same as nationwide here in Nebraska, yeah. What's being done to close that gap? So a lot of awareness. I mean, we're looking at issues that impact women in the workplace. For example, paid family and medical leave. Like we still don't have that as a standard in Nebraska. One in four Nebraska workers do not have access to paid sick leave. So when you think about if you get the flu or if you need to take a COVID test or you need to stay home with caregiving responsibilities, there are many, many Nebraskans that don't have access to that time. And it's so important to keep people in the workforce. Are there certain industries that are better about that or more inclusive towards women in that way? I think it depends. It's case by case. I mean, there's some small businesses that really believe in, in working as a family mm -hmm. and taking care of individuals. A lot in our nonprofit industry are doing it, but it's not standardized across the state. And that is where I think we need to push the needle a little bit more. What as an employee in an organization can you say or how do you how do you spark this conversation of like inclusivity and more equality? Hi, yeah, I think it can start with your HR department. It can start with the person that leads you in terms of a team to have those conversations. And you wanna think about things like employee recruitment and retention. I mean, we've all seen in our pandemic world that when workers have the supports that they need, then they're more likely to stay at a company. They're more likely to recruit a friend or a former coworker. They're more likely to not only be loyal, but to be highly productive. And so sparking that conversation among coworkers and saying, what else can we do to support people as we're returning to work, as we're coming out of a pandemic? Speaking of that pandemic, what are, if you had to give three tips to any industry right now to help close that gap, specifically for women who have not returned to the workforce, what would your like top three tips be? Let's see, the top three tips I would say, well, let's talk about pay equity. Um, that would probably be number one. Uh, number two would be looking at workplace support. So things like paid sick leave, um, family leave, parental leave, um, and then also childcare, because that's a huge issue. As you kind of mentioned, um, the average cost in Nebraska for an infant is $11,000 a year for high quality childcare at a childcare center. So when you think about the economics to be able to pay for that and to have that support so workers feel comfortable and parents are able to come to work, that would be one of the things. Would flexibility change that at all? Absolutely. Uh, yeah, more flexible workplace seems to be, you'd <laughs> yes. have more people working yes. from home. Yes, we, we at the Women's Fund have, have been a leader in that prior to the pandemic. We've always had flexible work schedules, so that was just a natural extension of what we do to support workers. We also have unlimited PTO. 
which is another way to support our employees to make sure they have the time that they need to do outside of work activities, but also be productive employees. How do you sell that though to some of your you know, more traditional C-suite <laughs> suits that maybe it's not such a bad thing to have your workforce working from home? Right. Well, do they want workers? Do they want really great workers? Do they want workers to stay and be engaged um, and help bring the diversity of thought and experience to their workplace? I mean, those are all really important things to think about when you want to improve your workforce. Now, totally switching gears. Obviously, yes. our focus here is women, but what can men do? Because we're not alone in this as women. No, we're not. And interestingly, the Women's Fund of Omaha has recently uh, hired our first male employee Wow, yes, who okay. works with our Freedom From Violence initiative, which is about domestic violence, sexual assault, and sex trafficking. And it's important for us to model gender diversity, not only in our workplace, but also thinking about what are the contributions of men? How can they be allies to women? And it's really important for men to be along in this journey as well, to think about how important it is for women to be able to make decisions about their bodies and about their family and about their work life and how that can contribute to a household. So a little more recognition on everybody's part. Yes, I mean, it's about awareness and it's about what can you do in your life, in your community, in, your, um, in, in our state to support women and to make sure that every woman and girl has the opportunity to reach their full potential. If people want to learn more, how, what's the best way to get a hold of you guys? To go to our website, it's omahawomensfund.org, and we are celebrating women in this month with gender equity champions. So if you make a donation to honor somebody in your life who's been a gender equity champion, uh, we'll have a beautiful digital publication as a way to say these are the rock stars in our community who have been supporting women and girls. Well, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it today. Now, still to come, we are celebrating women's in, women in health care, and we will hear from a Methodist doctor on diversifying the medical field, plus a community champion who helps keep others safe from COVID-19. Her motivation for staying on the front lines for over two years. You are watching KETV News Watch 7's Chronicle.